So you may have noticed, I have a lot of tools. I have a lot of tools. I have a lot of tools. And in fact, my wife tells me, you have a problem. And everyone else tells me they want a shop tour. But I just can't show you all my tools without some results. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna design and fabricate a catapult with every machine in my shop. That's nine catapults, and they're all gonna be totally different. And this will let me show you the machines and how they work, but it'll also give us some really fun results. I also see some very exciting ways to prank my wife. What's in the box? I have all these tools so I can make whatever pops into my head as quickly as possible. They're basically the conduit from my brain to the physical world, and it's awesome. Each of the catapults that I'm gonna make corresponds to a different part of the shop. I have tools for working with metals and plastics, additively and subtractively, and a whole lot of other stuff. This should be cool because it'll show just how many ways you can solve a problem. Thinking this through, I'm gonna have to stretch the definition of the catapult really far. This is definitely a catapult, right? So here's my rules. It shoots half inch steel bearings. This is the premier size to take an eye out. All of the important parts need to be made on the machine. So if I was making a 3D printed catapult, I couldn't just 3D print the trigger for a potato cannon. I'm gonna be trying to keep the danger level to a, about a three out of 10. We'll see how that goes. I had try not to get too carried away, but I've already broken that rule, so it's gone. I really should stop saying catapult, but I've said it too many times. So, they're catapults. We're gonna start simple with some of the more basic tools. I'm limiting myself to the bandsaw, the drill press, and the belt sander. For all of these designs, I'm using a really important tool called computer-aided design, although most people just call it CAD. I'm using Autodesk Inventor to design everything in the computer before I build anything. Doing this means that everything usually fits together, and it also lets me do things like calculating the strength. I came up with this kind of wacky handheld catapult, and I'm using the 3D model to make paper templates so that I can cut everything out accurately. This is a really powerful technique. You can make almost anything this way, it just takes a while. I'm using a little portable bandsaw on a stand that I made, and this thing is incredible. I use this on literally every project. The drill press and belt sander are cheap imports from Harbor Freight. I've had them for over a decade and they just won't die. I kind of wish they would so I could get a better one. You can do an incredible amount of things with these machines. They are definitely the most bang for buck way to get into making these kinds of things that I know. I invested in a high quality eight inch vise early on and I have zero regrets. This thing is amazing. I'm also using it to do some low end blacksmithing. A little glue and a couple screws and we've got a catapult. It looks like I just have one of those little white Looney Tunes surrender flags on it, doesn't it? All right, let's try it out. Cock it like this, ball goes here. I don't even know how to aim this thing. This thing turned out really cool. Because I love everything that I make, I asked my wife to give an impartial score. Really, a four? If this was a competition for a food fight tool, then it would be higher. You're lucky it wasn't loaded. <laughs> Breaking glass isn't the most scientific test, but it's the funnest test. This catapult is just impossible to aim. Well, that was anticlimactic. Let's make the next catapult. I am so jealous of kids these days growing up with their fancy 3D printers. When I was a kid, all I had was a corded drill and a rusty chisel, and I liked it. Anyway, I'm gonna make a catapult with my fancy 3D printers. I came up with a design that's fully 3D printed, including the spring. Plastic doesn't really wanna be a powerful spring, so I have 18 kind of weak plastic springs working together to make one mighty spring. This is one of the 3D printers I'm gonna be using. It's called a Form 3. It's a resin printer made by Formlabs. And as a fun little fact, I was actually responsible for developing this machine. That's what I was doing before I started making YouTube videos. This machine has a tank full of liquid plastic, which it shines a very tiny laser spot at. And wherever the light touches the plastic, it triggers a chemical reaction that turns it into a solid. The machine will steer the laser around to cure a very thin layer, and then it'll move that layer up and then cure another very thin layer on top of the previous layer. If you repeat that a bunch of times, eventually you get a solid thing. The parts come out sticky, so you wash them off in a bath of basically rubbing alcohol. These weird structures that the parts are on are automatically generated supports. This is actually an algorithm that I spent a lot of time on. They're super optimized, so they just break off and you have a nice part. If I could only have one tool in the shop, this machine would probably be it. 
So I don't think I've shown this in any videos. This is an SLS machine. It's called a Fuse One. It's also made by Formlabs. It prints things out of nylon powder and the parts are just fantastic. I said this was an SLS machine, but I think the more correct technical term for this is an absolute unit. It works by spreading out a very thin layer of nylon powder and then it melts together the areas that it wants to be solid using a laser. And just like the other machine, if you stack a bunch of these layers on top of each other, eventually you get a solid object. Uh! The parts come out surrounded in powder and you sift through it like an archeologist. This machine collects all the unused powder and then recycles it back into the machine so you don't waste it. If something I wanna make can be done on a 3D printer, that's what I'm gonna do. They take the least amount of work by far and they can also do the widest variety of shapes of any tool in my shop. The reasons that I won't use a 3D printer is that I need something big, very accurate, or very strong. I also wanna mention that I did not buy this. It was given to me. And that's actually true of almost all the big expensive tools in my shop. This has been one of the best things about having a YouTube channel. And it's great because you win, I win, and the toolmaker wins when something awesome gets made. And I'm so grateful to be in this position. There is just way too much to show here. If you want more details, keep an eye on my second channel. So this one's pretty similar to the last one, except for that it's totally different. You cock it like this, put it in the ball, and you're ready to fire. These things are just impossible to aim. That was kind of weak. IV4. This is better than a four. 18 leaf springs. Or one, two, three. Yeah, 18 leaf springs. I'd have to know what a leaf spring is to be impressed by that. Will it break the glass? Yeah, I didn't think so. All right, next up, we're gonna be looking at the CNC router. It's a Tormach 24R. It's basically a wood router attached to a robot that can move it around to cut out whatever shape you want. It's really good at making big things out of sheets. It cuts up to two by four feet, I use it to make all kinds of more precise wood stuff and especially explosive bats. I think a trebuchet would be perfect for this router. I was chatting with patrons on my Discord and someone brought up the really good idea of a floating arm trebuchet, so that's what we're gonna do. I'm holding the wood in place with plastic nails so that I don't break the bit when I hit one. I love using the router because it's really easy. You put your wood in, it cuts the parts out, and that's pretty much it. And those plastic nails just shear in half with a hammer tap. This whole thing goes together kind of like Lincoln Logs. The way I designed this is just a little bit too narrow. Here we go. That is way more powerful. Are you just messing with me now? Let's just fire it with 10 pounds. Ugh. Hopefully it doesn't break. Two, one. snap the arm in half. We won't get to find out if it would have broken the glass, but we all know it would have. <laughs> Milling machines take a lot of work to use, but they're probably the most satisfying tool in my shop. I've really been looking forward to designing a catapult for these machines. So one thing led to another and I accidentally made something kind of insane. This is a centrifugal catapult that fires half inch steel ball bearings full auto. This is way overkill for demoing my mills, but I just couldn't help myself. It's so cool. So I'm gonna build it and show how the mills work, but there's probably gonna be an entire video just about the awesome things that you can do with this kind of machine. The general idea is that you have a spinning arm that flings the balls. Before we can machine anything, we have to cut our stock out. The little bandsaw I showed earlier is a total workhorse, but when you wanna cut a slice off something like this, it just isn't gonna happen. So let's talk about my horizontal bandsaw. It's a Grizzly G0613 and I love it. This thing is perfect when I have thick stuff, long stuff, and when I need an accurate square or angled cut. This design is awesome because the entire vise rotates and you can cut really accurate miters. This is my first CNC machine. I actually made it in an apartment years ago and it doesn't get much use these days because I have bigger and better machines, but Building this, I learned so much about CNC. I really recommend it. It is a fantastic baptism by fire. Computer controlled CNC machines are amazing, but human controlled manual mills are also amazing. 
This is my Precision Matthews 935. It's called a knee mill because of the configuration of all the pieces. It's kind of a standard layout. Machines like this are great because you can just throw stuff in them and start cutting. You don't have to go up to computer and program the moves that it's gonna do. It's super fast for a certain type of work that I do all the time. It has knobs that you turn to move the thing you wanna cut in three dimensions. And you pretty much just force the cutter into the metal and it cuts through it like butter. Did you know you can cut metal with a sharp knife? That's exactly what these machines are doing. They're spinning a round knife that just cuts through the metal. One of the most important thing for milling machines is getting the speed and depth that the knives are cutting correct. People call these feeds and speeds. Whenever I show people the mill, they think that the part is gonna be really hot, but it's not. Most of the heat goes into these shavings, which are called chips, but they're not edible. There are tons of different tools and cutters to do different things in the mill, but I'm not gonna get into those. I'm using the mill to make a bunch of the simpler parts, and this part, which you would normally make on a lathe, I have two lathes, but according to my rules, I can't use them. But I can use my mill as a lathe, which is a nice trick to know, sometimes can get you out of a jam. When I need metal parts for a project, which is like every project ever, I'm using this machine. It's a Tormach 1100 MX. It's a CNC mill, so it's just like the manual mill, except for there's a computer turning the knobs instead of me. Computers are fast and precise, so they can do stuff that I just can't do with my hands. The liquid that it's spraying is called coolant. This lubricates the tool and keeps metal from sticking to it and is really important for washing chips away so they don't build up and break your tool. It holds 10 tools that it switches between automatically, which is amazing because I can just put metal in it and it'll make the part for me while I do other stuff. It also has this rotating axis that really reminds me of cooking something on a spit. It'll spin your part as it cuts and it'll allow you to do all kinds of fancy things. You can get machines that have a rotary axis like this stacked on top of another rotary axis. It sounds kind of crazy, but you can do some incredible things with that setup. I don't know if you're out there, Haas, but if you can hear me, I'd love to talk about a UMC 500. I can at least dream, right? This thing is so over-engineered. I think in French they call this a resistance piece. Hold on, why is there a 3D printed part here? I mean, if you're gonna cheat, you might as well commit, right? You spin the launcher mechanism with this crank and drop a ball in, and it should launch it. Okay. It's not at all where I was expecting it to fire. This is like my hundredth try. Finally. More chooch means more power. And I totally agree with that score, although it's not really a score, but it will be fixed. In a future video, I'm going to attach a high power motor to this and do some really cool things. The other thing that it really needs is a timing mechanism so the balls go in at the right point of the rotation. Right now, they go in at a random time and shoot out at a random point. We need them to always come out of the end of the tube at the same time so that they fly consistently. I'm not even gonna try to hit the glass. I could barely hit the foam. Metal joining and cutting is a really important part of my shop. It allows me to make big, strong things really fast. I'm going to weld up a steel replica of Da Vinci's catapult design. Before we can get to welding, I have to cut out a lot of thick steel, and we are gonna use a tool that would have absolutely blown Da Vinci's mind. This is plasma cutting. It is raw power cutting through steel like butter. The way they do this is super cool. Plasma cutters use electricity to make a super hot stream of ionized gas, which is called a plasma. Plasma conducts electricity, which allows an arc to form between the torch and the metal that you want to cut. The energy from the arc melts the metal, and the focused blast of ionized gas shoots the molten metal away. Add in some computer control and you can cut out whatever shape you want. This is a Tormach 1300 PL. It cuts up to four foot by four foot. And I cannot overstate how superior this is to cutting metal with a grinder or any other way. So this is the torch and this is what does the cutting. You can actually move this around by hand, but here I have it mounted to this gantry which moves it around and cuts out whatever shape you want. The whole thing is powered by a Hypertherm PowerMax power supply. I designed and built a plasma cutter before this one, but it isn't with us anymore. It's watching over the new machine from Plasma Cutter Heaven. And now the fun part. 
I'm welding everything with a Vulcan Pro TIG 200 from Harbor Freight. It is surprisingly good, but you can't get it. As far as I can tell, Harbor Freight got sued so hard by Lincoln Electric that they just deleted the thing from the internet. It's a TIG machine, which stands for Tungsten Inert Gas, which basically describes how the machine works. This pointy rod is the tungsten. It's charged with electricity, which makes an arc between it and the material you want to weld. This delivers so much energy that it melts the metal almost instantly. Although most metals have this annoying problem, when you get them very hot, they rust super fast. To avoid this, the machine flows a bubble of inert gas around the weld. In my case, it's argon. Argon is a noble gas, which means aside from its aristocratic lineage, it does not want to react with anything. Unlike oxygen, which will react with pretty much anything that moves. Since argon won't react with stuff, you don't get oxidation. TIG doesn't really fume or smoke, which is great for the basement. When you're welding parts, the heating and cooling tends to distort them. So my welding table has a very thick top, which you can clamp the parts to, and this helps minimize the warping. All these holes, which make it look like a precision block of Swiss cheese, are made to accept drop-in clamps and other fixtures, which makes setup super fast and easy. If you're wondering, my welding table is called a rhino cart. To make the catapult spring, I'm using this cool tool called a ring roller, and it's used for rolling rings. I think that's as much as I'm gonna be able to do. If you put your hand in front of this and it went off, I bet it would break your fingers. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that Da Vinci was one smart guy. With a few tweaks, this thing could be really powerful. We all know what's gonna happen with the glass, but come on. I know the Da Vinci catapult is fast, but I want to know how fast. And I have the perfect tool for the job. So there's eight of these cameras hanging from the ceiling throughout my shop. And these are motion tracking cameras. They're made by a company called OptiTrack. And you've probably seen these used in video games or movies. You see people wearing silly suits with white dots all over it. That's for these cameras. So the way that these work is they flash a really bright light that we can't see, it's invisible to humans, but the cameras can see it. And then anything that's reflective to that light bounces it back to the camera. This allows the camera to very reliably see the things you want to track. If you have multiple cameras, you can triangulate where that thing is in space. This is the same thing that your eyes do to figure out how far away stuff is. These things are super fast, super accurate, and the next project I'm working on uses the heck out of them. I think it's very fitting that you calibrate the tracking system by basically waving a magic wand. All right, the system is up and tracking a ball as I move it around on the table, and here we go. All right, this is pretty cool. This is the path that the ball took. The catapult zinged it up, it bounced off the foam, went into the ceiling, and then came out over here and fell to the ground. We hit about 38 miles per hour. It traversed my workbench in 150 milliseconds. That's how long a blink takes. Machining is awesome, although starting with a block of material and removing everything that isn't your part is pretty slow and expensive. This is why I love plasma cut and folded sheet metal. You're only using the material that you need to make the part, and it's really fast and easy to make big, strong things. For example, an all-metal crossbow. This crossbow has been designed to be folded out of thin sheet metal, kind of like origami. My CAD software can flatten it out into a pattern that I cut on the plasma cutter. This is basically the same as the Da Vinci catapult. When you cut thin sheet metal, a bit of the molten metal tends to stick to the bottom of the parts. I'm grinding it off at my downdraft. There's a powerful metal dust collector attached to it. This sucks all the metal particles away so they don't go into my lungs. I find it hard to spend tool bucks on safety stuff, but it is important. And it turns out my wife agrees. Finding a way to classify a tool as safety critical is the best way to sneak it by my wife. Isn't that amazing? Just look at the hot dog. Why don't you just not put your hand in the table saw? While we're on the topic of safety, let me show you what I do for first aid. If you're gonna have big tools, you have to be prepared for some big injuries. Tourniquet, just in case. This probably only applies to my shop, but if I have a chest wound, this will seal it. If I'm having a really bad day, it'll also seal the exit wound. So if you got a skin stapler, which I hope my wife will never have to use on me, but it is pretty easy to catch your scalp on the stuff, yeah. This is what I use whenever my wife talks about one of my projects. This is super glue for closing up wounds, way better than bandages. This is actually made for animals, not humans, but I think it's basically the same stuff and it's a lot cheaper. Don't quote me on that, I'm not a doctor. 
get the human stuff. The vet stuff is a bad idea. I'm an idiot and I'm gonna be getting the human stuff probably. Bending sheet metal accurately is really hard to do, which is why I have such a ridiculous bender. The technical term for this is a break and it's made by Grizzly. It'll do 16 gauge steel up to 50 inches wide. And this thing is phenomenal. The amount of pain I went through before I got this thing is just off the charts. Getting the bender is most of the work. Once you have it, it's pretty simple to use. You take whatever it is you wanna bend and clamp it in the brake, and then pull this pivoting part up to whatever bend angle you want. You can also take these fingers out to make clearance for bends that you couldn't make otherwise. And that's it. That's my first secret to sheet metal success. I normally wouldn't give you the second secret until you recruit at least three people to the program, but I'm feeling generous. The secret is spot welders. I think spot welders are just completely underrated. They are super useful, they're affordable, but I don't see anyone using them. I just don't understand it. So let me show you. You take two pieces of metal, clamp them in the spot welder, press the trigger, and you're done. Really high heat, a bit of pressure, and two become one, just like marriage. This will join all the pieces of the crossbow together super fast. I just love that even the string is sheet metal. This one, you have to cock it with a glove on. You never want to get your fingers in front of it. It seems to have a lot less power than I calculated. Five, can't believe you'd give that a five. As I said, for style. It has 18 stacked leaf springs. My wife isn't impressed with, I'm sure. These ones are all touching each other, so they all have to rub to fire, and you lose a lot of energy, I think. I think it shows what you can do with sheet metal pretty well, though. It's only cool if you can break your house windows with it. That's too bad, I thought this one was cool. This next catapult is designed for laser cutting. Laser cutting is a really fast, really useful prototyping tool. Before 3D printers, laser cutters were the king. My goal for this one is to make a wrist-mounted catapult. So this fancy glass box, this is my laser cutter. It's a Glowforge Pro. It cuts soft materials like wood and plastic with a beam of focused light. The focused light is delivered by a CO2 laser. This is basically a glass tube filled with CO2 with electrical connections on either end. When electricity is applied, it causes some of the CO2 to emit light, kind of like a tiny light bulb. But what's special about this glass tube is that it has mirrors on either end. Some of this light will go towards the mirrors and start bouncing back and forth between them. And sometimes something interesting happens when the light goes by another CO2 molecule. The CO2 molecule will emit more light, which will be going in the same direction as the light that's already bouncing back and forth between the mirrors. This is called stimulated emission, and it's basically what the word laser stands for. So you get this enormous buildup of light bouncing back and forth between these mirrors. If you were to figuratively poke a little hole in one of the mirrors, some of this light will come through, and it will be an intense beam of light all going in the same direction which doesn't really happen in nature, which is why lasers are so special. So whenever you point this laser at something, it just goes, what the heck? And disappears in a puff of smoke wherever the laser's touching it. You really don't wanna breathe this smoke, so it gets sucked up into this filter. The laser's moved around on a gantry so that it can cut anywhere on a sheet. Laser cutters are great because they're really easy to design for and cutting stuff out is fast and takes almost no work. You just load a 2D drawing of what you wanna cut in the software and hit cut, that's it. If you're in the market for one of these, there's a link in the description that'll get you $500 off. All right, who needs a taser when you can have a wrist rocket like this? All right, ready? <laughs> Not the most powerful. I really like how the low profile articulating pivot came out. I think with a couple tweaks, it could be quite a lot more powerful. <laughs> think I look like Spider-Man? Yep. It does look like Spider-Man's web shooter a little bit, especially the way you fire it. The glass is a lost cause. I accidentally kind of broke it, so it can't even hit the glass from one foot away now. Now for the project that's a real conundrum. How the heck am I gonna make a catapult on the lathe? You typically only make round parts on a lathe, but I can't think of any examples of catapults that are made out of round parts. Well, if you use my definition of catapult, I can think of one. Unfortunately, using explosives are against my rules, so we're gonna have to do something a little bit different. Everything is basically round, 
and air pressure counts. It's basically a spring, so I have an idea. I'm gonna build a launcher that you pump up and then release the pressure with a valve to shoot the ball. I have two lathes. This is my mini lathe, which I had in my apartment, and it is absolutely beaten to death. This is the big brother to my mini lathe. It's a Precision Matthews 1440 GT. This thing is just an absolute joy to use. The lathes work by holding whatever it is you want to cut in some kind of chuck. As the chuck spins, you stick various tools into the part to cut material off. And just like the mill, it cuts into the metal like butter. There's a ton of different tools that you can use in the lathe, but the thing that they pretty much all have in common is that they make round parts. I have an issue with the trigger valve for this launcher. Although it's possible, these parts are very difficult to make on a traditional lathe setup. Did you know a lathe is just a mill on its side with some missing parts? We can add those parts back. Now, we have a mill. Pretty cool. You can do milling with this, but you should not put it into a quick change tool post. It's not stiff and you can potentially damage stuff. Be smart, don't do what I did. I was able to get this pretty simple. The hardest parts to make were the check valves for the pump. I designed everything to go up to at least a thousand PSI, but I screwed up the pump and I'm way under that. You pump this one up a bunch of times. <laughs> <laughs> Can it break the glass? That's the question. No. No? No? Yeah. <laughs> Won't even break the glass. You showed me. I showed you, yeah. Not a great indoor toy. Eight. Yes, finally, it's twice as good. That's very satisfying. And this is definitely a catapult, right? Well, actually... It's just using the power of the wind rather than the power of the inclined plane or whatever. I really wasn't sure what the best catapult would be to show off my woodworking tools, but I've got it. I wanted one of my catapults to have a wife mode, so I'm making a box with a secret catapult in the lid. When you open the box, you won't see anything, but then the secret arm will come down and launch a ball at you. I have all these woodworking tools because they are surprisingly useful for making functional stuff. Aside from that, I do zero woodworking. This tool right here is a planer. It's a DeWalt 735, I think. Inside of it, there's a spinning set of blades that can remove a thin layer from a piece of wood. You put a plank of wood in one side and it comes out the other side slightly thinner, flat, and with a good surface finish. My main use of this is when I need accurate flat wood for some kind of fixture, or when I need to make a big flat piece of wood out of small glued together pieces. I did this a ton for my Crocs project. This is my compound miter saw. This thing is so useful. I think this is the first power tool I got for this shop. You can cut two by fours, you can cut smaller pieces of plywood, you can cut aluminum. I use this on almost every project. This machine is a joiner and I am absolutely terrified of it. This thing will take you from five fingers to zero in the blink of an eye. So it has a set of spinning blades just like the planer and it removes a thin layer of wood just like the planer. But the difference is that this is designed to make your wood square. So this wood is not square on the side. This is an extreme example, but you run it through the joiner a few times and it's square. I'm using a router table to make the rabbit joints for the box. There's not a whole lot to these. They just hold a router in a very dangerous mangle your hand upside down position. You can also get special bits for deburring and chamfering aluminum and steel. Woodworking machines make a ludicrous amount of dust. So I have a central dust collection system that sucks all the dust out of all the woodworking machines. This is a Grizzly 860 dust collector. It's centrifugal, which is super sweet. And inside the dust collector, it looks like this. At the center, there's essentially a shop vac pulling air in from all directions. And this end is open. It's where it sucks the dusty air in. And because the air has mass, as it comes in, it doesn't go straight into the hole. It actually spirals around and then goes into the vacuum. The sawdust in the air weighs a lot more. When it comes flying in, it can't actually make this sharp of a turn. So it hits the wall, slows down, and drops into the collection bin. The air continues on without the dust in it and gets sucked up into the vacuum. The dust that makes it through goes into this air filter, but it is an absolutely tiny amount of dust, which is really good because it would otherwise clog this filter, which is a huge hassle to deal with. If you're looking at getting a dust collector, I really recommend some kind of centrifugal one. Assembling the box is just straightforward woodworker stuff that I'm not very good at. 
I'm using a magnet to hold the ball on the catapult upside down. When someone opens this, they don't see the arm until it's too late. I haven't tried to pull any fast ones on my wife in quite a while, so I think I should be good. Check this out. What's in the box? It's my woodworking catapult. So smooth. Yeah, it turned out pretty nice. Oh! Ow! <laughs> Why would you point it at me? I've learned. This gets the 10. Best for last, I knew it. Let's see if we can hit something besides my neck. That's not surprising. I tried to make this one only a nuisance, not deadly. Don't you think we should put this in the guest room whenever we had people visit? Hmm. Ignoring performance, which is your favorite? Tube. Tube. Very satisfying to get in the phone there. I mean, they're also great. It's like, it's like choosing a favorite child. I knew you were gonna say that. I didn't say they're my children. I'm just saying it's like children. I think my favorite's the 3D printed one just because the design is unusual. All the stacked springs, it's like pocketable catapult. I, I actually really like the sheet metal one for the same reason, but I wouldn't say it's a good design, but it's interesting. It's not good, but it's unique. Yeah. I think I may have gotten a little bit carried away with all these catapults, at least a little bit. It was a lot of fun though, and I hope that you enjoyed it. I try really hard to give you a bit more than you bargained for with all these videos. And if you do enjoy them, please consider subscribing. It helps me out and it'll keep you in the loop when there's some new stuff made here. And like I said before, I designed so many things that I had to gloss over almost all the details. I'm planning to post more videos going into the details of these on my second channel. So check that out if you're interested. So if you think about what's actually happening here, I'm a guy in his basement building catapults for your enjoyment. It is a very strange time to be alive. And the reason I'm able to put so much time into projects like this that are kind of pointless, but hopefully entertaining and educational is mostly thanks to video sponsors. So if you wanna help ensure that more videos like this get made, taking a minute to check out the sponsor is very helpful. And the sponsor for this video is Micro Center. I'm a huge Micro Center fanboy. The fact that they wanna sponsor my videos is still amazing and makes me really happy. It all comes down to the fact that I'm a nerd, I do nerd things, and I need electronics, computers, 3D printers, and I need them now. Micro Center has all that and their prices are really good. I built my entire computer from parts from Micro Center and it was cheaper than buying the parts online. It's also the only physical store that I know of that I can go buy electronics kits. If you do anything even tangentially related to nerd stuff, you should go visit a Micro Center. There's 25 of them across the US. Take some time to walk around. You're gonna find stuff that you can't find anywhere else. And if you do go to one, they're doing something I think is a little crazy. They're gonna give you a free pair of Bluetooth headphones, like totally free. So if you're interested in headphones, all you have to do is click on the link in the description, put in your email, and they'll give you a coupon that you can take to the store and they'll give you a free pair of headphones. It's a little crazy they'll give you headphones just for visiting, but I guess they know the store is great and that you're gonna like it. So go check out Micro Center, it is great. And if you're interested, get some free headphones.